I welcome everybody to the second of our uh, San Jose State University College of Science virtual seminars during the COVID lockdown. Uh, I'm Michael Kaufman. I'm the Dean of the College of Science, and I'm really happy to welcome people um, from uh, throughout and beyond the college. Uh, one of my goals in putting this uh, series together was to build some community across San Jose State University, especially within the College of Science. And I'm very happy to see, um, just looking at the guest list, that we've got faculty from a whole bunch of our departments. We've got um, some people from the provost's office, some other deans, um, students from Moss Landing and other locations, uh, and uh, some friends of the college. So I'm very, very happy to see this. Um, today's speaker is Professor Amanda Kahn. Uh, Amanda is the newest faculty arrival to our marine sciences program at Moss Landing Marine Labs. Uh, and let me give you just a little bit of a bio on her. Amanda is a product of the California State University system, at least in part. Um, she got her bachelor's degree in biology from Cal State University East Bay. Uh, one of our neighbors. Um, then she went to Moss Landing where she got her um, master's degree in marine science. Uh, then she went to Alberta, Canada where she got her PhD in ecology uh, and um, I think started to work on some of the things that she's going to tell us about today. She stuck around there for a postdoc and then um, we hired her two years ago but she asked if, if she could spend a year at Mbari, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, which is right next to Moss Landing um, as a postdoc for a year. So she did that and built some great connections there um, and is now in her second semester teaching, uh, which has been an adventure, uh, I'm sure, for her. Um, today, she's going to tell us about uh, the secret life of sponges, uh, and I'm very excited to hear her speak. Um, for those of you in the audience, um, there is a Q&A box down at the bottom of the screen. And if you have questions for Amanda during the talk, feel free to enter them in there. I'm going to be the moderator. And if I see something that looks like it's relevant to something she's speaking about at that moment, I will interrupt her and ask her that question. Um, if not, we'll have some time for Q&A towards the end of the talk. So uh, without further ado, Amanda Khan. Hey, thank you so much for, for introducing me. That was a great introduction and also for organizing this. So it's great to connect with you all. Um, I, I feel so close to you. Uh, we're all physically as far, but also as socially close right now, um, regardless of what distance we're at. So nice to meet you all. Uh, my name is Amanda, and today I'm going to introduce you guys to the secret life of sponges, looking at energy flow in marine ecosystems from the perspective of a suspension feeder. So uh, without further ado, I primarily study sponges in the deep sea. And if you go down to the, the deep sea, this is what you would see. Uh, it's, it's pretty dark. So if we turn on the lights, it looks a bit more like this. So the deep sea is a really uh, foreign place to what we have here in shallower or terrestrial spaces. It's very cold, it's pitch black dark, and it's so far from photosynthetic plankton and primary production that deep sea communities rely on food that's imported from either the surface or from currents that come uh, from other locations. So the deep sea in general, what, how do we define that? Well, the deep ocean is on average about 4,000 meters deep, pretty darn deep. And so by the time that food from the surface sinks down through a variety of processes, there's only about one to three of the total amount of food that was at the surface that reaches the deep sea floor. So animals that live on the deep sea floor tend to rely on that food raining down called marine snow. And so particle feeders are common. So here in this view of the deep sea floor, these little pink guys are sea cucumbers, which snuffle around in the sediments and find bits of carbon that they can consume. We sort of speak in uh, carbon terms when we're talking about food. It's sort of the currency of food and energy. Uh, so particle feeders, deposit feeders are common, uh, but also suspension feeders, things that filter particles from the water and then are able to eat them by concentrating them on filters. And so that is the category that sponges sit in. And in this view, we've got three different sponges visible. We've got this tulip-shaped one on a stalk, 
got this volcano shaped one over here and this tube shaped one that's lying down flat on the sediments. So it might look sparse, but actually in terms of numbers, there are a, quite a few, or in terms of proportions, there are quite a few uh, sponges that live uh, in the deep ocean. And sponges and other filter feeders in general play a really important role uh, as being a connection between the food that's in the water column, the pelagic realm, and between food webs and other animals that live on or in the sediments, the benthic realm. And so in general, suspension feeders concentrate particles that are too small to be detected individually, uh, and they just concentrate them from large volumes of water. And so here are some pelagic filter feeders, things that you would find in the water column, like this swimming mollusk called a pteropod, uh, pyrosomes or salps, or they could be benthic. So uh, they could be sponges, our topic of today, but also bivalves, clams, mussels, barnacles, anything that's really capturing particles from a very dilute food source in the water and concentrating them. And maybe the most um, popular or well-known filter feeder is also the largest. So you, um, baleen whales are also suspension feeders, arguably, or filter feeders, because they're capturing krill, which would be much too small for them to catch individually. Instead, they're concentrating them to get their food and nutrients. And so um, as Dean Kaufman said, I am located at Moss Landing Marine Labs down in Moss Landing in Monterey Bay, and we have some amazing access to the deep ocean from there. So Moss Landing, here, here's the southern part of Monterey Bay, and here's Monterey and the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Up here is where Moss Landing is, and this is the Monterey Submarine Canyon, and that lets you get out to the deep ocean real quick. And so with that, we can get out from there and study um, animals in the deep sea and to try to understand how animals make a living in such a food poor environment. And that's actually the, the main focus of, uh, of my research is looking at the energy flow between animals in a place where there really isn't a lot of food to go around. And so my research so far has focused on sponges and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Uh, and Sponges are maybe something that you haven't thought about since your uh, introduction to biology or animal diversity classes that you took, uh, but actually we have a lot more interactions with sponges in everyday life than we may think. And humans have interacted with sponges for thousands of years. Um, the earliest records are that they were harvested by Greek fishermen who would grab onto this large stone called a scandalopetra and drop down to the seafloor grab sponges from the seafloor, and then bring them back up to the surface, all while holding their breath. And the sponge diver industry was a huge deal up until about 100 years ago. They would bring up the sponge, which would look something like this black slimy blob on the left, and then after cleaning and processing, it looks, well, like a sponge, uh, like something that you would use for spongy purposes. Nowadays, uh, the sponges that you use in your kitchen are traditionally made in factories out of cellulose, although you can still find these natural sea sponges in uh, Home Depot, uh, so they're used in painting and also as cosmetic applica applicators. So that sponge fishery was a huge deal right up until about World War II, and so these are some of the landings of sponges from these sponge fisheries. So it was a huge deal and it had a huge economic impact. But sponges have other majorly important human, um, or serve as important human resources in other ways. And one of those is that sponges are also major sources of pharmaceutical compounds. This sponge here is Leth Trunculia austini, one of the sponges that I've been studying in the deep sea. And recently, uh, other authors have published that this sponge, um, or an extract from this sponge, actually is active against human pancreatic cancer cells. And that's, um, it's not uncommon actually for sponges to have such resources. About 30% of the marine derived compounds that we currently use in pharmaceuticals uh, come from sponges. Uh, they've been used for everything from anti-cancer to antiviral, antibacterial, um, and then uh, one of the first treatments for HIV actually came uh, from a sponge. And so a lot of uses. Finally, sponges make their skeletons out of glass. 
uh, many groups do. And these glass skeletal rods actually can, um, can conduct light and transmit light through them with the same properties as fiber optic cables, but uh, they are more flexible, less likely to break, and sponges are able to produce them with just ambient seawater at cold temperatures, whereas when we make fiber optic cables, it requires harsh chemicals and um, high temperatures. So there's also a lot of potential for becoming inspired by the sort of um, development that sponges have made. So yeah, we've interacted a lot with sponges, but also sponges aren't just important for what they do for us, they're also important animals in their ecosystems. Uh, so they're found throughout the world's oceans. These are all pictures of sponges in tropical coral reefs, but you can see they can be a variety of shapes and colors. Uh, some are massive, so here's a diver for scale. Uh, and many of them have associations with symbiotic bacteria that really alter the way that they interact with their environment. So I'm interested in sponges as animals. How do they work and what do they do in their habitats? What is all that filter feeding doing for them? And so sometimes when you look at a sponge, it looks like a lump on the seafloor. But if you use just a little bit other of other visualization, you can see a bit more of what's going on. So here's a sponge that's had a non-toxic fluorescent dye applied around the sides of it, which helps you see just how much water the sponge is pumping through and out of its body. And so sponges are filter feeders. Uh, they can pump up to 900 times their own body volume each day. And with that water that they pump through, they draw it in from the outer surface of the sponge into canals that eventually pass through these filtration areas before being pumped out and released. And in these filter areas, they capture particles as small as bacteria. So here's what one of these filtration chambers looks like. And so these cells are called coanocytes. Each one has a flagellum that sticks out here, here, and a collar of microvilli. And with those, they're able to draw water through all of these canals and to capture food. And the primary food source of sponges is bacteria. And this is the thing that really inspired me when I started studying marine science. And actually, I started studying sponges um, as a master's student but not because of what they ate. I was really just interested in, I described a, a couple of new species of deep sea sponges. But as I read more about them, I realized that, I recognized that not a lot of other animals are able to tap into this bacterial food source. And so sponges are really uh, fairly unique in their ability to eat very, very tiny food particles uh, that other animals can't. And so I asked the question, you know, what, what are sponges doing with that food? And is that food that they're eating moving into different habitats and into other members of the food web? So bacteria are very, very tiny, as I said, but they make up 10 to 30% of the organic matter, the productivity uh, in many parts of the ocean, and they're too small for other animals to eat. So here is a sponge, uh, Geodia barretti, that I incubated with microscopic plastic beads. And just 30 minutes later, you can see the efficiency with which it's able to filter particles of the size and type that it enjoys. So just 30 minutes later, the water was completely clear of these beads. Now this, the size of the beads here was 0 0.1 to 1 micrometer in diameter. So that's pretty tiny. And so the efficiency that sponges are able to capture food is also really important. And through that really efficient filter feeding, sponges have been proposed to be a solution to Darwin's paradox. So Darwin's paradox was as he was sailing around on the beagle, he saw coral reefs and coral reefs are jam packed with life. And yet they live in nutrient poor waters, a food desert, just very similar to what's the case in the deep ocean. So this map shows the flow of food energy through an ecosystem. In gray is the animal food web and what travels to them. So particulate organic carbon forms the basis for most of the food that goes into animal food webs. There's also a huge resource of food as carbon called dissolved organic carbon. But dissolved organic carbon is dissolved. It's things like amino acids or dissolved sugars in the water. And it's things that animals can't really take up directly 
So instead, dissolved organic carbon and the black arrows here are members of the microbial food web, where microbes, including bacteria, are able to consume that carbon. So sponges were proposed to be a solution to Darwin's paradox by bridging the gap between the microbial food web and the animal food webs. And so how do they do that? Well, by eating bacteria, which um, then taps into that microbial food loop. And then if other animals eat sponges or eat things that sponges have excreted that came from bacteria, then you're moving carbon from this microbial food loop into the animal food web. So my research so far has focused on uh, a few questions, or at least I want to talk about these ones today. There are a few other. I, I was telling Dean Kaufman before the talk, it's fun when you have to triage and, and think of which things to present and which things not to. So there's a lot more um, that we've gotten to kind of investigate, but here's what we'll talk about today. So one, um, one of my fundamental questions, what effect do sponges have on their environment? And specifically in the deep sea, what effect do they have? Also, how do they do that? In what ways are they affecting the environment? And at what cost to them? So um, an outline. So we're going to start out by looking at this first question, what effect sponges uh, have on their environment? And to do that, we've looked at carbon flow and uh, the behaviors of deep sea sponges. And then when we look at how they do it, um, we'll look at feeding and the different modes of feeding that sponges employ. And then to figure out how much it actually costs for them to do all of this, uh, we'll look at their energy expenditure and behaviors. So starting out with this first question, um, I want to talk about a couple of the locations that we've done work and where this work has been done. Uh, so it's happened in the Pacific Ocean, it's happened in the Atlantic, up north, in Canada and down here uh, on the west coast of California. So um, it's really neat to get to compare all over. And to get to these deep sea sponges, I'll introduce you to each of these locations. They're a little bit different, but there are also some similarities. One is the way that we access the deep ocean. And so I've primarily gotten to work, have been very fortunate to work with uh, groups that have remotely operated vehicles, which act as our eyes and our hands underwater. So here's uh, the remotely operated vehicle Doc Ricketts, which is part of Mbari's fleet. And it has a large high definition camera here. There's our eyes. And then also these arms, which act as our hands. And they can do precise collections of particular animals that we want to collect. But they can also deploy instruments. And so engineering has been a huge part of, well, collaborating with engineers has been a huge part of how I've been able to work in the deep sea because you know, these robot hands are amazing, but they can crush rocks. And so you have to be a little bit uh, careful with your design of instruments to make sure that it's something that is robust enough to hold up, stand up to um, the remotely operated vehicle's strength um, and also fits with its capabilities. And again, the capabilities have been amazing because of the engineering and also actually because of the pilots who operate these. So a couple of the places that we've looked at deep sponges, one of those is on the Abyssal Plain. So the Abyssal Plain is the world's largest habitat. Uh, it covers about 75% of the planet. Um, again, remember the average depth is about 4,000 meters, so over two miles deep. And this is what it looks like. Um, but there are other places, so sponges are fairly abundant here, but there are other places where sponges do come in much greater quantities or densities. And so those are called sponge grounds. And those are where it's been really fruitful to look, um, to study the effect of sponges on their surroundings. Because if there are a lot of sponges, you're more likely to see a strong effect. And so here's the first sponge ground to introduce you to. So these are the glass sponge reefs of Western Canada. Uh, this is the reason I moved to Canada. I read about them. They only form on the west coast of Canada and now southeast Alaska. Um, and uh, they're beautiful. They form the foundation of a massive collection of sponges that make up a reef. So a reef is defined as a, a habitat that is cre created 
where the newest generations or the youngest generations are growing on the skeletons or bodies of former generations. So if you think of coral reefs, that's how they grow. They secrete skeleton and the newest um, polyps are just living on the top of that. And you see from this flyover here, it's the same with the sponge reefs. It's a pretty muddy habitat, but the sponges are growing on dead skeletons that you can see sort of scattered throughout. And so they really do form a habitat as a foundation. And so these are a great place to study the effects of sponges on their environment because they're dense sponges, they cover a large area, and in this case it's a near monoculture. There are only a few species present. Um, and so we started here and then we've added complexity to that, starting with moving north from those sponge reefs into northern British Columbia. So up near Hecate Strait, um, I was fortunate to work with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans to study uh, what was up until recently Canada's newest marine protected area. There's now one newer. Um, so that was the Hecate Strait and Queen Charlotte Sound glass sponge reefs. And so here, this is not quite a monoculture. There are three species that make up these reefs, Aphrocalistes vastus, Heterocone calyx, and Ferrea oca. But in both cases, you can see the foundation that the reefs lay that then allows other sponges to grow, but it actually also allows other species to grow besides those reef forming species. So in this picture, it forms an important habitat for rock fishes. And you can see other sponges like this yellow sponge on the side here that's growing in the habitat that's created by the reefs. And some work that um, a student that I mentored at the University of Alberta has done looked at the diversity of fauna within the sponge reefs and there's a huge amount of fauna even just living settled in the dead skeletons of the sponge. So another habitat to introduce you to is in the North Atlantic. So this was for my uh, part of my first postdoc. Um, so I went out to the North Atlantic to Norway to study oster beds. So oster uh, is Norwegian for cheese bottom. And so it's what fishermen would call these oster beds because when they would look with their fish finders or with their uh, sonar, they would see these weird holes all over the seafloor like Swiss cheese. Um, and so actually what they were seeing uh, were these sponges that litter the seafloor. So this is Geodia beretai. It's a massive sponge um, that's about the size of a volleyball but feels like a volleyball filled with sand. It is a dense sponge. Uh, so we worked with the Institute of Marine Research in Norway on that. And then uh, with my year at Ambari, I was able to start up getting to study uh, sponges in another habitat where deep sponges and corals coincide. So greater diversity once again. These are bubblegum corals and bamboo corals at Sur Ridge off the coast of Big Sur. But also on Sur Ridge, there are these huge meter tall and meter diameter sponges that grow up looking like strange trumpets or gramophones sticking out of the seafloor. Um, and there are several different species and varieties of sponges that live there. You can kind of see from these flyovers some of the different ones. Um, and so from when I first started studying that near monoculture of sponges, we focused on a lot of how that sponge worked. And as I've moved to different species, it's only made it more interesting to realize how diverse the strategies are of sponges. Oh. That sponge up there, the white sheet-like one, it smells like freshly cut grass when you bring it up to the surface. It's the weirdest thing. Sponges are great. So now that you know the habitats, I'm going to bring up data that's um, from those different places to address some of these different questions. Um, so going back to those questions, here they are. We're gonna start with what effect deep sponges have on their environment. And the first bit of data I wanna present is some of our newest, um, so this is in collaboration with uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans. This is from Hecate Strait. And uh, Stephanie Archer there led our study doing a food web study of animals that lived in the sponge reefs. And so here's a food web. I don't know if everyone has seen these before, but these networks to me look like um, one of those cartoons of a uh, family circus where the, the boy like runs and jumps over the fence and then climbs the tree and then, you know, hops over a puddle and, you know, but really the arrows here, <laughs> are telling you who's eating whom. Um, and so zooplankton are eating particulate organic carbon. So the arrows here show the movement of food energy. Zooplankton can also eat each other or they can be eaten by the animals 
that are up in the other ends of the arrows. And so with this, we were able to create a food web using stable isotope analysis. And here's where sponges lie. And so it looks like sponges aren't just producing habitat for the animals that live in the sponge reefs, but they're actually also serving as a food source. And that might not sound like a surprise, you know, why not graze on a sponge, but they do have skeletons made of glass and the skeletons are about 80 to 90% of their biomass. So it really wasn't thought that they were a major food source. So here on the left, it shows um, an analysis where, uh, where we looked at what contribution sponges make to the diets of these different fauna. And you can see that for some, um, like Saramaster, it can actually be a fair amount of Saramaster's diet compared to the other potential diet sources that we studied. So they could be food directly, but also for the animals that don't nip and bite at sponges, sponges could still be a food source through other things that they put out. So as I said before, sponges eat bacteria. So this is some um, microscopy work that we've done on Aphrocalistes vastus from the glass sponge reefs. And so this is us getting to look inside of the tissue and see those filtering structures. So in green here are um, the parts of the body that help filter water. And you can see, let's see, they're a little cut off, but here's a flagellum here. There's another flagellum there and that collar. So we fed these sponges microscopic plastic beads that were one micrometer in diameter or 0.1 micron. And we also fed them bacteria. And then we looked at where those ended up and which ones were captured. And we found that they were captured efficiently. They were engulfed by the sponge, packaged, and actually, um, we followed their feeding to look at how that moves through the body. Um, and we kind of lost track of them after about 24 hours, except that we did start to find fecal pellets. I shouldn't say that we serendipitously found fecal pellets. This was probably my white whale of this project, was trying to find and identify and recognize like what does sponge poop look like? And why is this important? It's because where is the food that a sponge is eating? Where is that going? So sponges can either eat the food and turn it into their own tissue, which is good for them, and also good for the things that eat them. But whatever they poop out can also be food that is available for other deposit feeders. So this means that um, the food that's eaten by a sponge, depending on what size it is when it comes out, it might be of a size that can be handled by these deposit feeders. And sure enough, Though the bacteria were extremely small, the fecal pellets were aggregates of those fecal of those uh, particles. And so we could see here those same microplastic beads packaged up in a much larger mucousy sort of, well, fecal pellet. Uh, and so those fecal pellets being so much larger are in the size range that's available for um, sea cucumbers and other deposit feeders that snuffle through the sediments to eat. By the way, this is a sea pig. It is a sea cucumber, uh, but they just have modified tube feet um, so that they can walk on uh, the sediments. The other thing that I want to point out here, because it's going to become important in a few minutes, is looking at this tissue again, just how sparse the tissue is of the glass sponge. So notice how skinny and thin this layer is there's actually very, very little tissue in this sponge. And so that's the other really key thing that we noted is that, you know, the sponges are very efficient at capturing food. Um, they can capture really tiny bacteria, but they also don't have a lot of tissue that they need to support. So using remotely operated vehicles and water samplers, we collected paired samples from Aphrocalistes vastus uh, in the sponge reefs in the Strait of Georgia. And we collected paired samples. Some were ambient water outside of the sponge and some were in that chimney-like space or that hole called the osculum, which is where all of that filtered water gets pumped out. And so by collecting water samples there uh, and outside of the sponge, we were able to see what was present uh, in the water before it passed through a sponge and what was added or removed. And so with that, we were able to come up with a plot that looks something like this. And so this looks at the percent change of various different components in the water uh, at before and after passing through the sponge. And so here, after, um, uh, after passing out of the sponge, the water that came out was extremely depleted in bacteria. Up to 95% of bacteria had been removed from that water 
There was no appreciable change in nitrate or nitrite uh, silicates, even though these do take up silica, um, and other nutrients as well, including uh, organic carbon, were not really affected. But ammonia was excreted. And so this actually is a very animal-like thing to do. Um, animals tend to eat particulate carbon and excrete ammonia. Uh, that is something that we do as well. And so um, this was something that wasn't really unexpected for an animal, but it was pretty impressive just with the level of efficiency that they're eating bacteria and with the amount of ammonia that they're excreting. We also found that they used a very, very small amount of oxygen while they did that. And so this is sort of a teaser of what I'm gonna talk about at the end when we talk about energy budgets and energetics. So just expanding beyond uh, the Strait of Georgia and Aphrocalistes vastus, we also looked at two other species that form the reefs up in Hecate Strait. Um, and we took samples there and found that they also eat bacteria and excrete ammonia. And we went, okay, from this we can see that Sponges are very animal-like. Um, they are eating particulate carbon, uh, but they're eating particulate carbon of a particular size, which is the small bacteria, and then they're excreting ammonia. And so with those numbers, we can scale up from an individual sponge um, to, say, use the average size and pumping rate of a sponge, scale that up to a square meter patch of sponges with a given density that we've measured, up to a whole reef that we've mapped to try to look at how much sponge cover there is, and then eventually up to all reefs to get an idea of what effect sponges were having in the deep environments uh, where they live in these big aggregations. And so we've done that so far with the reefs in the Strait of Georgia, and we found that um, these numbers, and so to walk you through these numbers, the water processing rate is the amount of water that's pumped or processed by, that's filtered by um, a square meter patch of sponges per day. So it's about 110 to 250 cubic meters of water. This value tells you um, the clearance rate, which is the volume of water from which they would clear all uh, particles that are in it that are their food source. And so this one you could kind of think of as how much water overlying a square meter patch of sponges, the sponges would completely empty of water. And so here are the values. Here they are in comparison for other values that had been published. So in tropical sponge assemblages, they could be quite high. Um, and in soft sediment communities in San Francisco Bay, they were 40 to 60, but definitely the highest was in these extremely dense glass sponge reefs. And so it looks like deep sea sponges in these sponge reefs are involved in that sponge loop and make a really important difference to the water just based on the sheer volume of water that they're eating and the amount of carbon that they're therefore processing and moving from the water column and from the microbial food web into their tissues or into um, excreted material. So let's ask, is this common across all deep sea sponges? Well, we did go to Hecate Strait and it was starting to look that way. But then I went to Norway and we started to study geodia. And so geodia is very different sponge. Um, it's actually of a different class of sponges. All of those others are part of class Hexactinellida. Uh, this guy is class Demospongiae. And um, it's very, very dense. So the inside of it is not super sparse. In fact, if you look close up, uh, it's chock full of something. And so here's that coanocyte chamber, that filtration apparatus that's in the sponge for pumping and filtering water. But everywhere else you see, these are bacteria that are living inside of the sponge tissue. And so when we looked at the feeding of the sponge here in the same way of collecting paired water samples, we found that yes, they were extremely efficient at removing bacteria from the water, but these sponges also removed organic carbon. And instead of excreting ammonia, they actually took up ammonia and nitrite, and they excreted nitrate and phosphate. So it was a very, very different, not very animal-like way to eat. Uh, and so um, pretty much, geodia looks like it feeds in a very different way, and that can be attributed to those bacteria. So while we did see that geodia does eat bacteria, so here's one of these water pumping cells, and here are bacteria chomped up inside. We also could see 
sponge cells that were engulfing the bacteria that lived inside of the tissue in this region. And so these were not necessarily bacteria um, that, that got there or were put there by the sponge. They grew up there, but the sponge was able to go through and then eat those bacteria, engulf them and feed on it. So in a way, you could think of Geodia as living in a food desert, but its strategy is to have a farm of bacteria living inside of it. Those bacteria are able to do very different things to the water. The bacteria are likely the, the cause for the organic carbon uptake, the nitrate uptake, and the nitrite excretion. Um, so cool, different. And then you look at other ones. So now we're looking at carnivorous sponges. Yeah, that's right, carnivorous sponges. So these are sponges in the deep sea that have eschewed their filter feeding lifestyles completely. And now they are able to capture and engulf prey on these long filaments that stick out. So small crustaceans that are unfortunate enough to brush up against these will become ensnared and then slowly engulfed by a sponge. And so really what it's looking like is that um, not all species make their living in the same way, but they all have adaptations to survive uh, where there is little food. And so going back to these questions, um, what effect do deep sponges have on their environment? Well, a lot actually. So we already recognize sponge grounds as foundation habitats, but also through their role in converting food um, and bringing food in from the microbial food web, they can act as oases in an otherwise food poor habitat. And how they do that is by finding novel ways to catch that food. And so for the last bit of my talk, um, I want to talk about what it costs to sponges to do that and how they kind of deal with those costs. So the costs that a sponge could have and that any animal would have is um, you've got to balance what food is coming in with all of the expenses that your body would have. So some of that goes to respiration. Uh, some of that gets excreted through either urine or feces. And the rest of that gets used inside of your tissue uh, for various processes of growth, cell maintenance, and reproduction. And so those are sorts of the energy budgets of any critters. Uh, so a lot of my other research has been on looking at the energy balance and the energy budgets of sponges and other organisms. So where do sponges fall in this? Well, here we did a comparison of different uh, phyla of animals and we looked at the respiration rates that were published in the literature and we found that sponges have an extremely variable range or a wide range of respiration rates and respiration is a great proxy for the amount of energy that you use because well if you think about it as we're all sitting at home uh, we might not be using as much energy than say if we were running on a treadmill or going out for a run outside uh, so we can use oxygen consumption and respiration to tell us something about how much energy different things cost to do. And so just like this person who's wearing this mask that allows uh, this person over here to measure his respiration rate and therefore his metabolic rate, we can measure the cost of different activities on sponges as well. And so with Embari, uh, I've worked uh, with some really amazing engineers there on some technology to get to do that. And we're applying this not just to sponges, but we're trying to look at the balance of energy in various different species and compare it. So between sponges, corals, sea cucumbers, the different deep sea fish that live down there and understand sort of the scope of what animals can do to make a living in a food poor environment. So this is an oxygen sensor that's been plunged down into the gullet of this sponge. And so with that, it's measuring the amount of oxygen in that effluent water. And so this is what the data might look like. We would measure from the ambient water surrounding the sponge first, then we would plunge that oxygen sensor into that effluent water, and the difference there would give us a respiration rate. So coupled with that, we need to have pumping rates of the sponge, because just like that guy running on a treadmill, um, he's probably going to be breathing harder if he's running faster. And so we wanna know how fast sponges are running, by how much water they're pumping. And again, this is important not just because we wanna know what a sponge is doing, but because a sponge does so much through its filter feeding activity. And so the amount of water that a sponge is pumping tells us 
how hard it's working, and also how much of an effect it's having on carbon cycling and energy flow in their habitats. So for that, um, this has been in collaboration with Kakani Katija and Yost Daniels at Embari. Um, and so this is Deep PIV, which is a particle imaging velocimeter. It shines a sheet of laser down. Uh, so this is a laser sheet and there's a camera looking orthogonal to it. And so with that, any particles that are moving across that sheet are illuminated and you can therefore see water flow. So the deep PIV is amazing because typically PIV is a method that you can use in the lab. Uh, but here it's been developed to actually go down in the deep ocean and be used in the field. And so this sponge had a sheet of laser light pointed to it and the camera looking at the sponge now. So this is the top of the sponge and that siphon or that osculum. And once we get it positioned, we turn down the lights and then we can film and see the flow of particles that are coming out of the sponge and compare that both to the ambient currents um, and all, but more so to look at the pumping rate of the sponge. I should say we're also looking at how the ambient currents affect the amount of water that's coming out of the sponge, but that's a, a different question. So with that, we're able to actually take those data and calculate the vectors and estimate the volume that's pumped by a sponge. And so when we combine that with the energetics that we measure or the respiration rates that we measure, we can get some measurements of the energy balance of different sponges. And so, so far we've got feeding data and respiration data for Aphrocalistes and Geodia beretii shown here. So you can see Aphrocalistes does not use very much oxygen at all. We've converted this to units of carbon because that's the currency of energy, but we, um, it, it comes, there's a conversion between oxygen and carbon you can use. Um, so Aphrocalistes does not use very much oxygen, um, and this is how much food it draws in or eats. In contrast, Geodia is a guzzler. This guy uses a lot of oxygen, uh, but also has a much higher intake of food. And so we're able to calculate the energy balance here and see that a lot of Geodia's nutrition comes from that dissolved organic carbon, uh, which again is something that microbes take up. And so those farmed bacteria inside of it are really important for allowing it to have uh, such a high respiration rate. They may also be responsible for that respiration rate, but nevertheless, it's a balance. So we're not quite there with the feeding data yet for the sponges that we've looked at with DPIV and oxygen at Ambari and at Sir Ridge, but We've been able to sample from a variety of different species. All of these are glass sponge species, hexactinellids, which is the same as Aphrocalistes. And we see bulk oxygen removal that's similar in magnitude to what we saw for Aphrocalistes. And so it does look like they are sippers of oxygen versus guzzlers. And so in general, it looks like sponges, for the most part, have a low cost lifestyle. So going back to these questions, what effects sponges have on their environment? They're oases in food poor habitats and they catch novel sources of food. Um, and one thing I wanna end with is our, our latest publication. So that's that sponges live at their own pace. And so when we look at all of this, sponges can look like lumps on the seafloor unless we visualize how much they're pumping. But also it's hard to get an idea of how much activity a sponge is actually doing. Um, and so this was a time-lapse view of the abyssal plain at Station M off the coast of Point Conception. And you could see various sea cucumbers zipping around. Here's something that looks like a nose moving around that actually is a, a sea urchin. Um, and that actually was the focal species that Mike Vardaro um, studied. I, he's an affiliated uh, lecturer, I think, with San Jose, or maybe. Um, so also in view are sponges. And you might not think to look at the sponges at first, but I want you to keep your eye on this tulip shaped one here. So these photos are taken once every hour. And you can see that on that time scale, there are times when that sponge contracts and shrinks down in size before expanding back up. That is not uncommon to see. And actually all of these sponges are doing these changes in size and these contractions. So those contractions are times when the sponges may not be pumping water and filter feeding as much. And we just wouldn't catch it because if we actually look, and we did look and processed those images through a variety of image JScripts. Um, so I'm just gonna skip through this for time. 
we were able to see the contractions that happened for different sponges. And so uh, you can see this sponge's record here as it's contracting, and then it expands back up, shrinks back down. It's gonna do it. Expands back up, there we go. Yeah, so, so we could see this, but I think the most telling thing that we saw is these behaviors took a long time so those uh, time-lapse views usually were for about four to five months at a time. When we had those records, we never knew when the camera was going to point opportunistically the sponge. This was actually an instrument that was a camera tripod that was thrown off the back deck of a ship and sank 4,000 meters to land on the seafloor and take pictures of whatever it was looking at. Um, and so sometimes, serendipitously, it landed looking at a sponge. And this was 30 years of time series data at a long-term study site. Those opportunistic times that it looked at a sponge were really, really telling. So what to, stuck out to me is that these contractions were extremely rhythmic, but they were on really different time scales than what I would have thought to look at. Um, so a lot of these sponges had rhythmic contractions that happened every two weeks or so, and they could be short contractions or they could be long in duration. So these took about four days to go from uh, fully expanded, contracted, and back up again. We also, from the time-lapse camera, were able to see changes in morphology of one of these neat carnivorous sponges. So this was just a neat observation. So it was thought that when carnivorous sponges had this small disc like this, that that was a juvenile and that they would extend these filaments once they were mature. But from this video or from this time-lapse, we were able to see that in truth, that's not what's happening at all. This is an extremely dynamic animal that while slow paced is opening up and casting its net to capture prey and then retracting it when it doesn't need that to be out anymore. And so it's a much more dynamic sort of view than we think. And so with those behaviors, it's just happening on an extremely different time scale and a much slower time scale than any sorts of behaviors or rhythms seen in shallower species. So um, these are the amount of days that these cycles take. Um, and so a, a contraction takes about four days for this globe-shaped sponge. Um, it can take up to two weeks for this volcano-shaped sponge. And we're not sure yet what those causes are, but that's actually a, a project that an incoming graduate student who's going to join me is going to look at. So I'm really excited about that. Um, get that part. Uh, we've also uh, looked at shallow sponges and we see behaviors in them as well. So uh, these are contractions of shallow sponges. Here these dotted lines show when the sponge contracted in big ways. So you can see that uh, in blue shows the contractions. Um, and we tried to tie it to different environmental conditions. Um, and so that's something that we want to do in the deeper water as well. So this is a shallow sponge in western Canada. And this is actually a project that I'd love to start up uh, here um, now, that, now that we've got great diving capabilities is to start up some monitoring of shallower species of sponges and other filter feeders as well to look at um, their behaviors. Now one other thing I want to point out is that with this, um, those contractions were times that these sponges were not spent pumping or filtering or filter feeding. So if we want to study the carbon flow through ecosystems, especially where sponges are abundant or where they make up a large portion of the habitat, it's important to consider that they may not be pumping all the time. And so for these guys, they actually spent one third to half of the time not pumping or not filtering because they were contracted. So with that, back to this, we can now say a little bit about these. Um, so sponges are oases in food poor habitats. They find novel ways to catch food. Uh, and they may have a fairly low cost lifestyle, both in terms of their uh, oxygen consumption and also maybe in terms of their behaviors. So what if those contractions are not linked to any sorts of climactic events or other cyclic events at all, but it's just a way to hunker down and work in the realm of food availability that you have. Um, and so we're now looking at, more looking at what their cost of lifestyle is by looking at their behaviors, what drives them, and also by looking at the respiration and energy budgets of sponges in different habitats and different environments. And so that's gonna be sort of my next direction of research is this has been great. 
we have learned a lot about the deep sea, but how does this compare to what we would see anywhere else or for different animals? So we want to look at whether suspension feeders in general uh, serve the same sorts of functions or have the same magnitude of carbon flow that cycles through them. And for the cost, what is the cost of being a filter feeder, whether you're a sponge, an oyster, a clam? And how does that compare to living in some other mode, like being a deposit feeder or being a pelagic, um, free drifting sort of filter feeder versus a benthic one? And so all of these are things that are really neat because without that context, it's hard to say how different these sponges are other than how specialized they are for the deep ocean. And so with that, this is a, a summary slide, um, but I just want to end by saying um, sponges hopefully are more interesting than just looking like lumps on a seafloor. They actually are quite dynamic. They have really important roles in their uh, ecology. And I am really looking forward to looking more into um, sort of how they affect different, the flow of different nutrients in their environment. So silicon, um, dissolved organic carbon, uh, different nitrogen compounds, and at looking at how things like hypoxia or different temperatures can affect the uptake of those nutrients and of those different um, biogeochemical products. Um, and finally, my, my graduate student, Sarah, um, is just developing her thesis uh, idea now, but she's interested in looking at sponges' roles in harboring and sequestering eDNA or environmental DNA. And so whether sponges can also serve as sentinels for other fauna that live in their environments. So there's a lot that can be done with them. And I'm really hoping that in the questions, we talk about all sorts of ideas that we could do together. Um, so with that, I would love to take questions. I have a lot of people to acknowledge. So I'll leave this slide up while I take questions um, to acknowledge my collaborators fully. And thank you. Thank you, Amanda. What a fascinating talk. Uh, I'm gonna use the, um, the moderator's prerogative and ask the first question, um, but there are a bunch of other questions and I think I figured out how to let people ask them in their own voices. Um, so uh, we'll give that a try in a second. Um, so my question um, has to do with um, the microplastics that you used uh, or the microbees that you used as probes of the, I guess of the digestive or the, the ingestion process of the sponges. Um, and one of the first things I thought of is what about all the microplastics we're dumping in the ocean and our sponges collecting them and then and condensing them in the same way that heavy metals are collected by large fish and so on. I think that's a great question. It wasn't something that we initially were planning to do by feeding them those beads, but sponges love plastics. That was actually one of the things that I came out of when doing that is I started with feeding them glass beads, microscopic glass beads, and they didn't like them. It was just passed right through and rejected. Um, they're very selective, but something about the organic coating of the plastic was tasty or savory and so they grabbed it. So it hasn't been looked at yet whether they accumulate and store plastics or whether they would excrete them out. Uh, but yeah, I think looking more at at whether you can see any sort of accumulation would be really worthwhile. Great, thanks. Wish I had a better definitive answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm gonna uh, go to the first questioner after me. That's Phil Heller. Um, Phil, I've just unmuted you. So you should be able to speak. Can you hear me? I can. Hi, Phil. Hi, Amanda. Um, my question was about the, uh, the glass building, uh, the reef building glass sponges. Due to climate change, are their ranges moving north? Ooh, do we know that? Uh, so far, no, but um, it's interesting. So they tend to grow on glacially scoured uh, ridges up in the environment where they are. And the, the glacial scour actually was scoured during the last ice age. So six to 9,000 years ago, depending on how far south you are. And so in the intervening time, there's been a lot of sedimentation that's covered up those ridges, which means that the new ridges that are higher up are not necessarily available as the original substrate for the first reef building glass sponges to settle on and grow. Um, so as now, the sponge reefs can grow because there's a foundation of sponges beneath them that somewhere way down there, there's bedrock. Without that, I'm not sure how they would do at sort of oozing or expanding their way northward. 
those, I should say, those species really curiously are found throughout the world oceans. They're just not forming reefs in other places, which is an amazing question in and of itself. Why did they do that there? What is enabling them to live in such high densities there? Great. Thank you, Phil. Um, the next question comes from June. Um, and June actually had some great, uh, a whole variety of questions. Um, it looks to me like one or two of her questions may have been answered in your talk already, um, but I'm gonna open up her talking. If she wants to turn her mic on, she can ask the question herself. Are you there, June? There we go. Hi, Amanda, can you hear me? Hi, June. Yeah, I can. Yay, the world of sponges. Thanks for giving <laughs> such a thorough overview of them. <laughs> There, there's more. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have yeah, some pretty diverse questions. I'll just narrow it down to the ones that I'm most interested in. Um, so the first one is more about just the idea of there being carnivorous sponges. So I was wondering, are there any differences? Has it been studied if there's differences in how carnivorous versus filter feeding or other functional groups process and excrete different nutrients in the deep sea? Ooh, not, not yet, June. That is actually <laughs> a plan that we have. So, um, so we've been out at Sir Ridge and we've been seeing this um, filamentous uh, carnivorous sponge called Asbesta pluma monticola. And we've collected a bunch of them now. Actually, I'm looking for a student who may want to study this um, with me, but is to look at the community of fauna that are eaten by sponges and to then take those off and figure out how much energy is in that food. Because we can estimate how much energy is in a bacterial particle based on its size and its biomass characteristics. But you know, microcrustaceans, it would be really great to collect them and then combust them and look at their carbon content and actually figure out how much food they're actually getting out of eating those. Um, and likewise, there's a carnivorous tunicate, Megalodicopia hyans. It kind of looks like a puppet. It's like, it looks pretty much like this. Um, so it's, it's a tunicate, which is a filter feeder, but it has modified one of its siphons into this big mouth. And so it's thought that they are now carnivores as well. But they still have the same net and mesh for filtration that the filter feeding tunicates have. So it'd be really neat to see what balance they have of both diet that's or contribution of energy from carnivory versus how much of their energy is coming from filter feeding so yeah these are all things i really want to look at that's really cool can i sneak in a second question sure go ahead one more <laughs> i'm really curious about the sponge fishery that you touched on in the beginning those are incredible photos and so i was wondering what caused the decline in the fishery and do you think it might return in the future Ooh, well, the next time you're in Florida, make sure to go to Tarpon Springs, because that is where, uh, I don't know how long ago, a few hundred years ago, maybe 150, um, Greek fishermen brought sponges and created a fishery in Tarpon Springs. And so we actually have a domestic sponge fishery here um, in Tarpon Springs. Uh, but yeah, it's not as big of a commodity. It became limited or there were fewer fishermen that were going out fishing during World War II. And after that, cellulose sponges maybe were cheaper to make. And so it just didn't really bounce back in that same way once the fishery had already been hurt. But there is actually still an active but small artisanal fishery in Tarpon Springs and in Greece of, you know, sponge fishermen who don't want to give up their ways and who can sell these sponges still. Um, I'd be curious if we could make any sponge fisheries out here. There are actually only about five species that work as, as commercial bath sponges because most sponges have these really sharp skeletal elements, either glass or calcium carbonate. So that would hurt. That would be more like rubbing yourself with fiberglass. Um, so the five species that don't have those spicules are the ones that we use for um, sponge fisheries. Okay. okay. Uh, One other thing about that, sorry, uh, there okay. is a lot of work, like a lot of people are trying to do aquaculture on sponges, not so much for them as bath sponges, but because of their importance for producing medical compounds. So um, if we could rear them up, it would be great to have bioreactors that are just making Halochondrin B, which is an anti-cancer uh, chemotherapy treatment 
rather than having to synthesize it in the lab. Very cool. Oh, Mort. Hello, All right. Mort. Mort. Mort Randolph is our next questioner. Let's see. Oh, I think I just disabled Mort. Hold on a second. Give me one second. There we go. Mort is now allowed to speak. Mort has to uh, click his microphone, right? There you um, go. <laughs> the, um, how do you know that when the sponge is cr contracting, it's not flowing? Or equivalently, you know, do you have kind of that time lapse showing how much uh, it's filtering versus uh, how contracted it is? Oh, I wish we did. Yeah, we, we don't because those were really opportunistic observations. That camera fell down and looked at a sponge and so we didn't know that it was going to measure or, or be observing that sponge contracting. But uh, we do want to do that. So uh, part of my collaboration at Ambari with Jim Berry, um, Steve Litvin and Chris Lavera is uh, for the Deep Sponge and Coral Observatory. Disco. Um, and so that's going to be a, an observatory at Sir Ridge that's going to measure a variety of parameters um, using cameras that actually focus closely on corals or sponges to try to get an idea of how much activity they're actually doing. So in theory, we could say shine a sheet of laser every once in a while and see how much the sponge is actually pumping at different times. Or the technology I used before fancy lasers, um, thermistors work really well. So you can create thermistors that can measure uh, flow by just small changes in temperature as the water's moving past. And so with that, you could insert a thermistor into a sponge osculum and leave it there and see how that sponge is pumping over time. If anyone knows how to build thermistors, I would love to talk to you, by the way. Did I answer all of your questions on that, Mort? Yes, you did. In my very first job, it was uh, working with thermistors, but I wasn't building them at the time. Oh, fantastic. Well, I may ask you questions anyway about it. <laughs> I have some plans. I just don't know how to make that into a reality. And I have some engineering faculty who can help you out, too. Oh, that would be wonderful. Uh, okay, next question is from Benjamin Horst. Benjamin. There he is. Hi, Amanda. Can you hear me? Hi there. Yes, I can. Awesome. Uh, really wonderful seminar. Um, I have a question about um, sponge predators on the deep sea floor. You mentioned that sponges are like food oases, and you've also kind of alluded to the fact that they have a lot of um, um, potential uh, toxic compounds in there. Um, so are there many predators for deep sea sponges that are trying to hack into that food oasis? Um, do the deep sea sponges have these toxic chemicals? I'm guessing that we probably sample mostly from shallow sponges. And if they do, um, do we know if those chemicals are targeted against bacteria that are invasive or other predators or other eukaryotes or something, anything like that? Those are great and diverse questions. Yes, um, we know some of those things. So um, you're absolutely right that, you know, there's this conflict of sponges are tasty, even if they're crunchy with those spicules, um, but they do produce these toxic chemicals. And so that is one of the ideas of why they produce those chemicals is because as something that's stuck to the seafloor, a sessile animal, you can't escape your predators. And so by being either unpalatable or toxic, it's going to help you avoid um, consumption. And so there's a lot of work in shallower water where they will um, mash up sponges and put them into fish feed and then look at whether fish have a preference for that food or an aversion to that food and so kind of see whether fish are willing to eat sponges or whether there's some um, predator deterrence to that. But you're right, that hasn't really been done in the deep ocean. Um, and, uh, and yet, there must be some sponges that do produce compounds. Actually, the one that I put in the slides, La Trunculia austini, that one is a deep sea sponge. It looks like a tiny moon that is olive green and it, it's the weirdest one. It, it contracts and expands and you can see it and it smells funny. And that's the thing, like a lot of sponges, if you grab them and actually the next time you guys go to a beach or if you find freshwater sponges, um, grab them and smell them because they will smell very different. And a lot of the time that's because of those secondary metabolites that they produce for predator defense for them or for other reasons and for medical importance for us. Um, but yeah, what they deter, who knows? Some of them may be for 
you know, the ones that turn out to be antibacterial, they might be antibacterial because they're preventing fouling. The ones that are antiviral, they may have functions as well for the sponge that are beneficial. Or it might just be that it's something that's a really complicated compound that doesn't taste good. And as a bonus, it ends up having negative effects on microbes or whatever else we find. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have a question from uh, Heather Hawk. Uh, I'm not sure if she still wants to answer it. I'll put her on here and see if she uh, wants to add in. Heather, do you want to ask a question? There we go. Sure, but my question has changed uh, in the last few minutes. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> uh, I mean, it's sort of, I started with, um, uh, what was my, the original one was, oh, well, yeah, like, what I heard is that a lot of this, it, the um, information about sponge reefs and the roles of sponges has really come out of the North Pacific. But are you guys, what do you think about other places that are um, similar in environment? My other question I'll get to later, but that's okay. But that's okay. My, main, my main one. <laughs> Can I ask for clarification? Do you mean um, how, how, do they, how are they similar and how do they differ or why do sponges not form reefs in those other places? Yeah, the latter. The um, latter. Why not? Like why, why is it, is it just a matter of sampling effort in the North Pacific? Or is it really something about the sponges that have been there that are? There are a few. Forming? Yeah, there are a few things that make sponges in the sponge reefs particularly reefy or reef capable. And so one of those is their internal structure. So I believe I have a picture um, I'll flash up here. Um, so this is um, this is what that skeletal network looks like. And so actually. Oh, I don't have the next slide. Um, so this skeletal network is something that starts looking in this big disarray, but then these skeletal elements become fused. And so even after the sponge dies, for this and other members of its particular um, subfamily, it's actually able to stay as a dead skeleton. Whereas in a lot of other glass sponges and all of the other non-glass sponges, you don't really have that ability because you don't have that secondarily fused skeleton. But that said, there are places where there are dense sponge grounds where sponges do form really important habitats. Um, so in the North Atlantic, there are the bird's nest sponges, Vazella portulaceae, which form these massive um, open areas, expanses of sponges. And so they don't get very tall and they don't live uh, necessarily super long or make these structures that persist, but there are so many of them that they're probably still filtering the water and having a big effect. And then Geodia barretti, the oster beds, those oster beds stretch across the whole North Atlantic as well. So it's again a spot where there are a lot of sponges that are able to live in what's otherwise should be just abyssal plain and otherwise just fairly sparse habitats. And so once you get those sponges, then you get all of the associated fauna and they can also modify the conditions around them if they are these reef forming guys. And finally, there were some really neat looking sponge reefs or the beginnings of sponge reefs that look like they're forming um, off the coast of the Azores and off of Portugal and Spain. And so um, that's actually another species of Africalistes that was there. So it's kind of neat that there are still other uh, potential reefs that we just may not have found yet. And finally, finally, we found a glass sponge reef on a cruise that I was on in Southern California. And this is so not published, but this was broadcast live because I was out on Nautilus Live. The, um, it's this great platform that goes out and they live stream all of their ROV dives. And that was the same dive that we actually found these deep sea octopuses that I'm using as my backdrop. And they got all the press, but let me tell you, I was on the microphone the whole time talking about how amazing it was to find another habitat where you could have these reef forming sponges growing. So we don't know why they're there, but it's now looking like they're not restricted just to the North Pacific. Long-winded, but I love this stuff. <laughs> Very cool. So I think we're on our last question. Um, Steve Morgan had a question. Um, so I'll open up his ability to speak. He has to turn on his microphone if he wants to talk to us. Can you hear me now? We I can. can. Hello. OK, yes, I was wondering if you know of anyone studying uh, uh, whether sponges are able to filter and metabolize 
uh, byproducts of petroleum from oil spills, such as up uh, near the Prince William Sound area or in the Channel Islands area of Southern California or San Francisco Bay or even possibly in the Gulf of Mexico? That's a really interesting question. Um, let's see. Possibly depending on the sponge. And I would say, which I'm not sure, can animals in general metabolize uh, petroleum byproducts? I've occasionally heard of some bacteria able to do it. But, okay, because uh, that's, that's kind of where I'm going. I think, so there are sponges that are low microbial abundance and sponges that are high microbial abundance sponges. So geodia that's packed full of bacteria, that's a high microbial abundance sponge. And its metabolism honestly is dictated by what its microbes are able to take up within its particular physiological tolerances as an animal. So if there are microbes living inside of a sponge that allow it, well, that metabolize petroleum products, then in theory, if the sponge is not harmed by it, it could do that. Um, I do know that geodia uh, lives in the deep ocean where they do deep oil drilling. And part of how we got funding for that project to study geodia was because um, Statoil, the oil company that's the state-run oil company for Norway, wanted an assessment for um, what the effect of oil and drilling was on geodia because geodia beds are all over in that region. And they found that when they were drilling, um, the sponges would disappear from near the drilling site. But once the drill was in place or once the rig was in place, the sponges could encroach back. And so it didn't seem like the presence of oil or any kind of leaking oil was the problem so much as just sort of the the drilling process and the drilling muds and the suspended sediments. Um, so maybe that hints at there being enough tolerance of sponges that that's something to look into. I don't know if anyone is currently looking at that, um, but I wanna look at various sponges and their metabolism. So if, if there are any candidates or any kind of candidate foods we could feed them, it would be great to hear them and we could kind of put that uh, in as some ideas to look at their natural diet and then what happens if you perturb that with you know, pollutants that may not be as deleterious as we think. Yes, maybe you could uh, farm some uh, oil uh, metabolizing bacteria into some of these sponges that house bacteria. Ooh, to, to think to inoculate a, a sponge to be able to eat what you wanted to eat? Yes. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> That's a really neat idea. Um, I've been trying to think of how to uh, decouple the metabolism that's coming from bacteria and what's coming from the sponge. So I've um, uh, been talking to, uh, to folks at Stanford who have a nano sims and we want to look at whether we could feed a sponge different foods and look at how say carbon travels, whether it's taken up as dissolved carbon or as a petroleum product, um, whether it's taken up by the bacteria and how much of it gets transferred to the sponge cells. So that would be a really neat sort of way to manipulate the sponge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Very cool. Um, that's the end of our questioner list. And I want to be respectful of people's time. We've gone a little bit over our plan, but uh, fascinating stuff. Amanda, thank you very, very much for your talk. And thank you to everyone who uh, tuned in uh, for the seminar today. Uh, the uh, there is a talk planned for next week, and there's actually a marine science connection to it as well. Uh, Phil Heller, who's in our um, computer science department, um, is going to talk about how he's applied some machine learning techniques to um, some coral reef data. Um, so I hope many of you are able to tune in. Look for an announcement of that early next week. And uh, thank you, everybody, for um, spending some time with us and look forward to seeing you in the future. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you. That was really nice. Great questions, too. I appreciate that. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Can you see people? Thank you, Amanda. That, that was, was fun. That was awesome. Did that work out? It wasn't yeah. too, too marini? No, no, it was great. Okay. I mean, it just, it's, you know, it gets your brain moving in new ways. I didn't know that um, some sponges had glass. Oh, yeah, it's neat Skeletons. too. We don't know how they do that because they just take it from dissolved silica. Mm -hmm. You know what else? Because I know you're a physicist. I'm really interested and I don't know how to approach um, 
uh, sponge filtration, uh, but I'd like to because they're, I mean, the way that they can pump and draw water through their bodies is really precisely constrained by, by physics, right? You've got to have cross-sectional areas that change and there are pressure drops that happen at different places. And mm -hmm. um, so part of what we're trying to do with our PIV is um, look at whether there is evidence of ambient currents having an effect on how much water is actually drawn through. Mm -hmm. But I don't actually know if that's even possible given the small canal dimensions and things like that. So I don't know how to is that a modeling sort of thing? <laughs> like, um, it's we've got pro it's probably a, it's probably a flow, so almost like a like a wind tunnel problem, right? Yeah. You put mm -hmm. you put, you put um, funnels of various shapes in a flow and see what effects they have. Um, I mean, I'm just guessing that the sort of the characteristic length of the water of the ambient flow is probably much much larger than the. Um, than the openings on the sponge. Yes, which for the, you, yeah. Which puts you in um, one of the regimes where it's easier to calculate these things. I see. Right. So we were, I think um, Steve Vogel said it was most likely viscous entrainment. So you'd have like the water passing over the top and that would create a negative pressure to draw it out. Yeah, exactly. So I get that part, but I think the problem is knowing how much resistance there is inside from all of those smaller canals. Yeah, first, that's a so. yeah, that's a good question. Um, okay. I have I have some colleagues I could uh, ping about that Ooh, if you're interested. That would be lovely. Thank you. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask one more question. Um, it looks like there's still a couple more people hanging on. Cool. Um, yeah. I noticed so the um, uh, the the sponge reefs. Uh, if I understood your graph correctly, the ones that are further north have much higher. They can clean a much bigger column. Is that correct? Um, we, we don't fully have the numbers on that yet. I'm okay. not sure. Yeah. Okay. Cause but I, different I species of, can. Okay. When the, yeah. This was different species then. So the, the, um, there yes. was one that was 180 meters or something like that. And the rest, oh. were, like they were, you know, 40 meters yes. per day. Right. Um, so is there a relationship between that and the, and the, um, and the food available or the material, the carbon available that they're cleaning? I probably. So it's hard okay. to say because I think part of it too is just how dense these are. So, okay, got you it. know, this was a wonderful monoculture. And so you, you have a lot of sponges in a square meter patch. Whereas here in a tropical okay. reef, you might have corals that are doing something else in that square meter patch as well. Oh, okay. So what so, you do, what you need to do is normalize this to the sponge density. Yeah. Right. And so, and that's what that square meter would do. But the problem is that the sponge density isn't the same in each of these places. So, right. Well, that's what yeah, I mean, though. Yeah. You, you put it correct. So, if one sponge covers 50% of the area and another sponge covers 10% oh. of the area, you just add a correction factor in mm -hmm. there. I mean, it doesn't tell you about the ability of the entire reef to do things, but it tells you on an organism basis. Right. I like that. Yeah. Because we struggled with size and how to really account for a big sponge and how much effect it has. Yeah. Oh, cool. cool. Can, can right. I show a bonus as well? Yeah, absolutely. This was something, the thing that I cut from my talk um, that I just think is the coolest. So I've also done a lot of microscopy. And so this is a view of uh, the inside of a sponge. Oh, where'd it go? So this is time lapse of cells oh inside of a sponge running around. Oh, it stopped. So those cells are the sponge itself? Yes, they are. Okay. So, um, so this is one of those chambers. Mm -hmm. uh, these are also smaller chambers and the colored cells are cells that were moving along and then eventually become cells that are part of those chambers. Okay. Um, so this was actually, we discovered stem cells in one of the earliest animals, which is pretty darn cool. Nice. Um, and then this is one of these glass skeletal pieces being moved around. And so this is oh, yeah. all time-lapse of freshwater sponges, which have been found, according to iNaturalist, have been found at Coyote Creek. Oh, so cool. I want to go down there and find them because okay. it would be wonderful to do this so, kind of work. So what are, sorry, what are the red and green? These are stem cells that okay. were moving along and then somehow got a signal to come in and turn into these pumping cells instead. And cool. what's really neat is sponges don't have nervous systems or mm -hmm. 
um, any kind of coordination that we can recognize. So it's always a puzzle to know how these cells know where to go or where they're needed. Um, oh, there was mitosis that just happened. Um, <laughs> so, so watching this, it's sort of like trying to figure out how a crowd moves as well. And actually I was at a conference where they were looking at schooling fish and locusts. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I learned so much that might be able to be applied to something like cells running around nice. uh, in a sponge or in our capillaries, because it's actually not that different for nice. how it works in us. Yeah. Okay. I am, okay. Gonna, I am gonna close the, the session. Thank you okay. again. That was awesome. And uh, uh, can't wait to hear more. Yay. Thank you so much again. Great. All right. Take Great. care. Bye. Bye, everyone.